Hi. A while ago, I experimented with an old 4-bit static RAM chip from 1984, and I built a controllable binary 8-bit counter. And I've had a bigger project in mind that will combine some other stuff I've experimented with already, along with these circuits, but I was struggling with how to proceed for this video because I didn't know where to start, really. So I experimented with what I thought would be the next steps so that I could get an idea of what I'd even need to do for a new video. But I kept running into problems with stuff not working as expected after hours and hours of messing around. So pretty soon I was pretty deep in the weeds and not sure how I was going to make a video about any of it, at least not with the technique I had been using. Um, I had some footage I could use, but I didn't really talk during any of it like I usually do, un unless you count swearing and, and crying. So you've probably noticed this video is already feeling different than the others, and that's part of the reason why. Uh, I'll talk more about that at the end, but right now, let's get into it. After struggling for a week on this, I was complaining to my wife about how nothing was working, and she said I should maybe come at it from a different angle. And of course, she had to tell me this like, I don't know, four times before it really sunk in. So yeah, that was a good idea. So today's project is going to be combining the RAM and counter circuits into something that makes it easier to read and write the bits. And the other parts that I was having problems with can wait. If you remember, the RAM circuit had dip switches for an 8-bit address to a RAM location, and the contents at the addressed memory is then displayed in binary with the four LEDs. And I also had four switches so that I could set a memory value and then switch between reading and writing by actually swapping two jumpers in the right order, which was very error-prone. Uh, it worked, but it wasn't easy to use. Um, it'd be a lot more fun to address the RAM chip automatically, because flipping a bunch of little switches and changing jumper wires by hand kind of sucks. And if my larger project is going to work out, doing it this way would be really annoying. So the idea today is to hook up the 8-bit counter to the RAM and hopefully make things easier to use. And I can adjust the speed that the counter runs at, flip the direction back and forth, and even pause and step it manually, which I think is going to be essential for using this. Since I have several of these old Cinertec SY2112A 4-bit static RAM chips from the 80s, I decided I didn't need to disassemble my previous RAM circuit to get started, but I still managed to suffer some serious analysis paralysis over trying to decide where to place it on the board. Um, sometimes just getting started is the hardest part. Finally, I picked a spot and got into it, and the first step was to hook up the power to the chip and then plug in all eight counter output bits into the eight address lines of the chip. And then I put a jumper on the read-write pin to use for when I test it. And then I also tied the chip select to low because I want it to always be enabled and it's an active low signal. Uh, I needed an easy way to see the output, so I popped in some LEDs. Of course, uh, as is the theme for this particular video, I immediately changed my mind and then moved them again, you know, for, for reasons. And then uh, I added 330 ohm resistors to the LEDs to protect them and the RAM from the current. And then I hooked them up to the four RAM data lines. And so at this point, I should be able to see what's in the RAM. And testing worked first try. The blue LEDs are showing the 8-bit address generated by the counter, and the red LEDs are the bits that were in RAM at that location. And it's all just random garbage values, but that's fine for now. So the obvious next step now would be to add a nicer way to program the RAM chip than using the dip switches and moving jumper wires around. My plan was to have one push button for each bit and then a fifth button that sort of acts like a save or a write button. So when I press the save, I want it to write whatever bits are being held down on the four buttons into the current RAM location. Um, however, if I hook the data buttons directly to the RAM lines, then whenever I push any of them while the RAM is in read mode, it'd be creating a bus conflict because both the RAM and the buttons would be sending voltage you know, through the same wires to the LEDs, to the outputs. And that's probably bad, although I'm not sure if it would actually damage the RAM chip, but it seems pretty plausible that it could or, or maybe would eventually as things heated up or something like that. So obviously I would like to try to avoid that. So I looked through my box of TTL chips and I found the SN74LS244N, which is a buffer chip with two four-bit channels on it that you can enable or disable independently. And basically it's kind of like a, like a door that can let the signals on a set of four lines through it or not, depending on if you have the enable bit set. Since both the RAM's write mode and the buffer's enable input are active low, 
uh, I need like a high signal by default to feed into those to keep them in read mode and disabled. So I tied a pull-up resistor onto the button so that it's high by default, and then the button goes low when I press it. And the data buttons are connected through the buffer, and the write button is now connected to both the RAM's read-write line and the enable-disable pin of the buffer. So I can toggle both the RAM chip mode and the data line connections at the same time with the push of a button. And this should prevent conflicts. Okay, so I push the second button, it's not making it through the buffer. So now, while I'm holding the second button, I push my read-write toggle. And now it gets through. So it's floating when I'm not pushing the read-write toggle, but when I push it for write mode, the output from the button gets through. And then the final step was just to hook the output of the buffer up to the RAM's data bus and then test it. And it worked. Um, I can easily program in values just by holding different combinations of the data buttons and then pressing the write button. And by using the counter's controls, I can step forward and back to easily program in a whole sequence of values or switch it to automatic mode and just count through what I've already programmed. And while I was messing around with this, you can probably see it, um, there was an unintended effect here where the LEDs actually go brighter when I push the write button. And I think that this is because the RAM's chip output high voltage is only around 2.4 volts, uh, and I would have expected a lot higher than that, but it's noted on the data sheet that that's the case. Um, so when the RAM chip is in read mode, a much lower voltage gets to the LEDs, but when it's in write mode, when the data lines are now being driven by the buffer chip instead, uh, they get a lot brighter. Now, I don't know why the RAM chip is so low, but it's documented in the data sheet as 2.4 volts, and that's almost exactly what I saw in the scope when I hooked it up to, to check to see what was going on. And so I'm pretty sure that's why the LEDs aren't as bright when I'm in read mode. But it, it's kind of a neat effect, actually, because it's almost like confirming that write is happening. So, you know, I actually really like, I, I like that. It's a happy accident. So after a while, my oldest teenager stopped in. And yes, I have more than one of those now. Uh, he messed around with it for a while, trying to set all the memory locations to a single value and seeing if he could tap the right button as fast as a clock ticked and such. And uh, in messing around with it, we found that you can't just hold down the right button and like leave your fingers off the data buttons just to clear the RAM. Like we thought maybe you could put it in auto count mode really fast and just hold right and you could zero the RAM, for example. But the data sheet seems to suggest why that doesn't work. Um, it looks to me like the timing diagram here is suggesting that the address needs to be set and stable before the read write line goes low and that the data needs to be stable by the time that signal goes from low to high, like that might be when it takes a snapshot, so to speak, of the data. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but it's almost as if it maybe it's taking a snapshot of the address when the read-write signal goes low, and then a snapshot of the data when it switches to high, and then that's when it programs it, possibly. So probably having the address change while the write button is pressed is maybe ignored, or it might just, you know, cause undefined behavior. Um, it didn't work in any case. While we were playing with the circuit, it became pretty apparent that we really needed a way to reset the address to zero. Uh, you know, otherwise programming it was like, it's tedious enough as it is, and it was way more tedious without a reset because you couldn't, you know, you'd have to back up like one by one to get all the way or put it on auto mode and just stop it, put it in manual mode right at the moment when you got to zero. And luckily, the SN74LS191 chips that I'm using for the counters support loading values at any time. So it doesn't even need to be synced with a clock pulse. So all you have to do is send a signal on the load pin and then it'll just set it to whatever value you have set on its inputs, which I wasn't using. So all I should need to do is tie their input lines to zero when I want to reset it and just toggle the load pin with a push button. So as I was hooking this up, uh, I made a discovery actually. So when I first built this circuit, I had just tied the load signal to high because, of course, I, I didn't want the counters randomly resetting to garbage while I was using them, or at least that's what I thought I did. And I remembered that I had noticed uh, in the video, I think, that a counter chip was weirdly hot. I just realized these chips are actually a little warm, which seems kind of surprising because it's not like they're doing anything very complicated. You know, I didn't think too much about it because it was at the end of the video I had gotten work. It, you know, I had gotten it working, and I'm like, okay, good, I'm done. I, maybe it just gets hot. I don't know. But it turns out that I had accidentally tied uh, one of these chips' min-max output pins, which is just like an indicator of if you're at the minimum or the maximum point in the count, and it's an output. I had accidentally tied it to high. I was one pin off. 
So that was bad. Not only was the counter chip not safeguarded against randomly resetting the garbage, which I, I don't remember noticing, but it, it probably was doing it. Um, it was basically stuck in a perpetual bus conflict on that one output, essentially. You know, the, the chip was trying to drive it, and then, of course, the power supply was trying to drive it as well. And luckily, the chip doesn't seem to be damaged, but it certainly was getting very hot, and it probably would have failed eventually. Like, if I'd left this on for hours, it probably would have overheated and died. Anyway, after hooking up the input lines to zero and plugging in my push button, uh, I can now reset the address to zero whenever I want. And it doesn't even have to be on a clock pulse. It can be paused and reset still works. And then I can still step. So this is a lot easier to play with now. Okay, well, this is super cool. And, you know, it almost feels like a computer, except it can't actually compute anything. So, you know, I guess it's not actually a computer, but it it is neat. And once I got over that initial hump, uh, and took a different path, you know, it, this actually was pretty easy to hook up, but it was a lot, it was a bit of a struggle to get there. So I said, I'd talk a bit about the video format at the end and well, now we're at the end and I've been a bit worried for a while now that if I keep doing these videos, that the projects might start getting bigger and more time consuming to do. And I've been worried that my, my existing approach is just not going to scale. Um, basically, my system was to have a vague idea in mind and then a reasonable idea of how to do it. And then I'd kick the family out of the room and I'd hit record for however long it took. And I'd do the whole thing linearly. Like, I'd start with an intro of sorts and then just go and, and do the circuit or do the idea. And then when I was done, I'd do my outro and then finally hit stop. And then I'd take that one or two hours of footage and then edit it down and, you know, all that stuff. And I really liked that approach because it was easy to capture the actual aha moments and the troubles and, you know, things like that. And that's what I wanted to show in these videos, you know, and I still do. But when I sat down to make this video the first time last weekend, I tried that approach as usual. And then I spent hours just being frustrated and, and like feeling the pressure while trying to debug what was going on or just understanding some basic stuff, you know, and so... My intro that I started recording with when I hit record didn't match at all what was happening anymore because things w immediately went off the rails. And like sometimes that could make for a good video, but it went so far off the rails into territory that I was just utterly confused about that I really, you know, I just needed to stop. You know, like I started, I started looking all over the place. Like before I hit stop, I was all over the place. I was looking at multiple data sheets and skimming them. And I wasn't always screen recording at the time and doing web searches. And it's like, I don't want the video to be a be that stuff you know and and even worse after a long time of doing it i i still managed to not figure out what the problem was at the time that approach you know has worked okay up until now but you know when when i have my screen recording and the camera rolling and i'm trying to remember to talk to the mic and then explain things at the same time and i don't actually know you know since i'm a beginner i don't actually know in depth what I'm even doing sometimes. So like, it's pretty hard to stop and, and try to explain as I'm doing it. If I'm not actually sure why I just, you know, tried to flip the transistor around, you know? So meanwhile, in the back of my head, this whole time, the rest of the family is basically banished from the room. And I know this, you know, and, and like, they're supposed to be quiet and they're in the other room and this goes on for hours and hours. And I just, I can't keep doing that because it's, it's just too stressful. It's too stressful for me to sit here. And of course it puts this burden on everybody else. So eventually I just stopped and gave up that video last weekend and I was like super grumpy like the whole rest of the weekend because it just it didn't work and I didn't I didn't know how to approach it with my old system I didn't have a beginning I didn't have any progress I didn't have an end you know I didn't have a video so in light of all that I felt like I needed to try something different and I really didn't want to film things and then script it after the fact but I really wasn't sure how else to do it I mean I didn't want to start the process again this weekend and then run into the same troubles and stress so I decided I really need to try a new approach. So I started and stopped the camera and then I tried to film, you know, the important bits of, of like assembly and when I did stuff and, and at moments, like at important moments, but I pushed the microphone out of the way and just didn't even try to speak while doing it. And this all went way smoother and was way less stressful, at least during the building part. And when I got done making it, uh, I was still stressed for a while because I wasn't sure how to turn that into a video. And so I, you know, because I didn't have any speech. So then I decided to try to edit it at first into like a rough sequence of events at least. And 
I was thinking about just doing that and hitting play and then maybe ad-libbing the video. But then I realized that I didn't even remember what I did and like what order I did stuff. And I hadn't made any notes. So then I started making notes from, you know, this rough edit that I did. And then the notes turned into this script. And so that's what happened. So now I'm reading, essentially reading a script to you. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if this will be the new process or not going forward, but I want to try keep making these. So I need to find some kind of a process that works and isn't like super stressful and time consuming. Otherwise I'm just, it's not going to be any fun and I'm not going to do it. So maybe that process means post filming scripting or, you know, maybe there's some kind of middle ground I haven't figured out yet, but who knows? Anyway, uh, if you have thoughts on the format, let me know in the comments. And if you know, if you liked it, hit thumbs up and subscribe. Hopefully I'll see y'all next time and who knows what the format will be. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye.